Okay, so synovial joint is also called diarthrosis because it is highly movable. And if you look closely at the structure of a typical synovial joint, you'll find that at the end of the articulating bones, there's the presence of articular cartilage, which helps to provide a smooth surface in between the two bones. But let's say, due to some reason, this articular cartilage gets destroyed. Then the exposed parts of the bone they rub on one another, inducing pain and inflammation. And this is what we call arthritis. Arthritis, joint and I guess it's inflammation. So arthritis occurs at synovial joint. This brings us back to the topic: where exactly are these synovial joints found in our body? We are going to look at the various types of synovial joints on the basis of axis about which they move. First, we have the plane or the gliding joint. As the name suggests, the articulating surfaces they are plain and they glide over one another. But there is no axis about which they move. So it is in non axial way. For example, the acromion clavicular joint. Within your hand, the joint in between the carpals, the joint between the carpal and metacarpal, and the joint between the bases of the metacarpal. The same is also applicable for the bones of a foot. Similarly, second, hinge joint. The joint, it looks like a pulley where the convex part articulates with the concave part and it moves about a transverse axis. So only movement possible are either flexion or extension. For example, radius, humerus, humeroradial joint. Ulna, humerus, humeroulnar joint. Imagine an axis passing transversely through these joints. Then the movement brought about are either flexion or extension. Similarly, the interphalangeal joint, phalangeal joint, flexor, extensor, your ankle joint, flexor, extensor. Next, okay, so what about your knee joint? It brings flexor and extensor. For the joint right here, flexor and extensor. But the thing about these joints is that they also bring certain limit of rotation. So they are modified knee joint. And since the articulating surfaces, they are present in the form of your knuckles, they are condylar joint. Pivot joint. I said that at elbow joint, flexion and extension is possible. But what about this movement right here? This movement occurs through a vertical axis passing through the bone and due to a joint called pivot joint. For example, the proximal and distal radio ulnar joint. Ellipsoid joint looks like a ball and socket joint, but it's not. Due to the ellipsoid structure, the rotation is inhibited, but it does so movement above transverse axis and anterior posterior axis. For example, your wrist joint. So it shows flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, the combination of all, rotation, not rotation, circumduction, but not rotation. Next, saddle joint. Here, two concave convex structure they articulate on one another and allow almost all movements. The lower part looks like the saddle on a horse, while the upper part looks like the feet of a horseman riding it. So, for example, your first carpal metacarpal joint. So, there's your flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, then there's circumduction, and slight bit of rotation. And finally, my favorite, the ball and socket joint. The reason it's my favorite is because it allows movement in almost all axis, transverse axis, flexion and extension, anterior posterior axis, abduction and adduction, combination of all, circumduction, vertical axis, rotation. There are two that you need to know. Glenohumeral joint and acetabulohumeral joint. In glenohumeral joint, the ball is larger as compared to the socket, so there is much higher flexibility but much lower stability. While here, the ball perfectly fits in the socket, so there is lower flexibility but much higher stability. Finally, I would like to thank Proko, the noted anatomist and medical master for the concept. Thank you.